It's possible that you think this is an ear, or that this is an ear, even though... Too many piercings, I guess. And these two could be thought of as ears, but uh, to be precise, what can be seen from the outside is just one part of the ear. So what makes up the entire ear then? Let's have a look at it on this general mammal figure. Teddy! The anatomical ear has three main parts. Embedded in the bone of the skull, you find the inner ear, the organ of actual hearing and balance, looking pretty much like a kraken. Hold on to your wooden leg! The barrel-like middle ear, also in the bone, is a sort of relay station with so-called auditory ossicles inside. The eardrum separates it from the outer ear we're all familiar with. It is that skin-covered cartilage funnel some elephants fly with. Yes, in fairy tales. And teachers used to yank on before phones with cameras were a thing. And even though this is the most spectacular, aromatic and tasty ear part, it's the least important for hearing. You'll still be able to hear even if it, I don't know, dries off or isn't there in the first place like in reptiles and birds. Despite its insignificance, dogs very often have annoying health issues with it. What obesity and cardiovascular diseases in humans, it's outer ear inflammation in dogs, also known as otitis externa, or external ear canal inflammation, referring to the mostly affected inner lining of the funnel. But how come that a problem so rare in people is such a common occurrence in dogs? Well, let's see. If an ear fairy would like to exit the ear canal starting from the eardrum, he wouldn't really have a hard time in people. In dogs, however, things are a wee bit different. You won't believe what just came out of Buster's ear. The long, narrow, L-shaped ear canal of the dog provides a microclimate more favorable to inflammation than that of a human ear. This in itself does not cause inflammation, several other factors need to align for that to happen. Otitis externa almost always has a complex causal background and we put the otherwise interlocking causes in four categories. One. Primary causes are the ones capable of causing inflammation on their own. In the first place, uncontested, we have allergies to various stuff. During the warm seasons, foreign bodies can come in as close seconds, such as screwdrivers, probably not very often, but grass on, aka foxtail, much more so. Way behind these two, we find the rest of the primary causes, like parasites, tumors, growth anomalies of the epithelium, and so on. The primary inflammation can be so mild that it's barely noticeable. This is especially true for allergies, which make up the majority of the cases. 3. Predisposing factors. And yes, I can count to 3. Uch, krotach, pupu. Even in Orkish I can, but the secondary causes come after predisposing factors for didactic reasons. So, predisposing factors do not cause inflammation directly, but make it easier for it to develop. Examples are extremely narrow ear canal, hanging ears, and very thick ear fur. And then two. Secondary causes are the yeasts and bacteria that in most cases inhabit the ear canal normally as well. They pay the rent, don't smoke and never make a rumpus, but if there's a primary inflammation or some predisposing factor present, their populations easily overgrow, lose their friendliness and kick the inflammation into serious gear. When severe symptoms are present, it's generally due to the secondary causes. And four, we have the perpetuating factors, which develop as a consequence of the inflammation, but in return make it harder for it to heal. Most important of them are the thickening of the skin, almost closing up the ear canal, the distortion of the eardrum, and the change of normal epithelial growth direction. 
To sum up, the primary causes and predisposing factors, be it separately or together, make up the often unnoticed burning fuse that lights the metaphorical barrel of gunpowder on fire, namely the secondary inflammation. Now this one is pretty hard to miss. With time, perpetuating factors join the puzzle, dousing cheap gas on the flames and the picture becomes complete. Symptoms of otitis externa aren't hard to guess. The dog tilts or shakes its head, scratches and lowers the affected ears. In some cases, thin, yellowish, extremely stinky goo of bacterial origin exits the ear canal, other times it's a thicker brown sludge which is more yeasty and makes bread dough rise. Inflammation can lead to complications as well. We frequently see auricular hematoma, a pillow-like pool of blood under the skin of the tip of the ear, which develops due to extreme head shaking and eventually creates cauliflower ears. The inflammation can spread to the middle ear or even the inner ear, resulting in hearing loss and balance issues. Diagnosing the fact of otitis externa is not a big feat, most of the time even the owner manages to do it based on the symptoms. The point of veterinary diagnostics is to map the causal background and to determine the severity of the disease, and this can be a bumpy road. Inspection is our main diagnostic tool, performed with a so-called otoscope or video otoscope in a more advanced setting. Inspecting the bottom of the deep and narrow ear canal is impossible with the naked eye unless you have some sort of unique ocular anatomy. The examination is best done in anesthesia of the dog. Large amount of discharge in the ear canal can unfortunately block the view. What do you think you'd be able to see in a lovely splodgy gooey ear canal? A. Unskippable video ads B. Nothing Or C. A monster B movie the answer is obviously B, but in the case of ear mite infection, we are not far off from C either. Rinsing and pre-treatment might be necessary just to be able to get a good look at the bottom of the ear canal and the eardrum. It's important to know the state of the eardrum because if the inflammation had already eroded a hole on it, the bacterial yeasty hot sauce entered the middle ear for sure, which means the middle ear is also infected, plus any eardrops we give will end up in the middle ear as well. And as it happens, some eardrops are toxic on the inner side of the eardrum and may only be given if the eardrum is intact. Ear discharge can be subjected to cytological examination and can also be cultured. The former is pretty much a must. These methods help us determine the characteristics of the inflammation and the types of microbes present, which points us towards the best choice of therapy. The goal of treatment is to eliminate all the causes and factors behind the disease, or at least to keep them at bay. In the minority of cases, again, the minority of cases, this is easy. Removing a not-too-old foxtail or screwdriver, for example, results in an almost instant recovery. The veterinarian gets canonized, maybe even rewarded with sour candy or vegan bacon, but most of the time this is not the case. If the inflammation isn't fresh and the secondary yeast's bacteria had enough time to overgrow, it becomes harder to empty the narrow, deep ear canal of the ever-accumulating gooish sludge of hell that constantly irritates the skin, ruins the efficiency of eardrops and upholds the inflammation. We do try to clean it out, but our access to the area is, shall we say, limited. Also, if eliminating the primary cause for good is problematic, allergy for example, any improvement will be temporary. The treatment can take weeks or even months and consists of applying disinfecting, cleaning, drying, anti-inflammatory, antibiotic and, if needed, antiparasitic solutions into the ear canal directly, using a combined preparation in most cases. Obviously, dogs just adore having their inflamed, painful ears flushed, picked, prodded and pecked at. One more step and I'll shoot. And if the owner's resolve evaporates, the treatment will fail. 
to combat this problem, several products with a lower application frequency have been developed, such as medicated earwigs and long-acting solutions. They require way less hustle at home, which is a great advantage, but they are only effective against certain microbes and every application needs to be preceded by a so-called deep flush, which is performed by a veterinarian and removes all discharge debris and whatnot from the ear canal, even the astral bodies of German classical composers. Was zum Teufel? The deep flush is also a diagnostic procedure, as it allows you to inspect the lower ear canal and the eardrum even in very sloppy ears. But why don't we use pills or tablets instead of this complicated wallowing in ear gunk? Well, medication taken orally does not remove the stagnant discharge from the ear, nor does it enter the discharge to kill all the pathogens in it. And this is a problem because neutralizing infected ear secretion is an absolutely crucial part of treating otitis externa. This does not mean that oral preparations are never used, they are, but in combination with externally applied products when attacking the disease internally also makes sense. Like when we're aiming for better symptomatic relief or when complications and perpetuating factors would block external products from reaching their target. Unfortunately, we can't always win. Some changes are irreversible, making the disease incurable by conservative means. This is the point where we have to consider the ancient Greek wisdom, there is no ear canal inflammation if there is no ear canal. Yes, you can completely remove the ear canal by surgery, only leaving the tip of the ear for aesthetic reasons. The procedure results in permanent deafness on the affected side, but gets rid of the inflammation and pain for good, and by the time the operation is even considered, the hearing is already lost to the disease. Summing it up, otitis externa of dogs is a common multifactorial disease, which may be difficult to cure depending on its cause and severity. The treatment can be rather frustrating for both the dog and the owner. There are several different medications at our disposal, most of them for external, some for internal use, and if everything fails, we can pick the nuclear option and surgically remove the ear canal. Awesome, right? And I kid you not, the ghost of Beethoven came out of his ear. And who's gonna believe this crap? The technical information in this video was fact-checked by ear diver Marton Balog. I thank him very much, as much as I thank Ilenko for their support. <laughs>